Um, so you might notice that the talk title did change. It's the exact same content though, so I still will talk about uh, keeping your business relevant with Twilio. I've also added a bit more about Twitch because I imagine some of you are probably interested in hearing about uh, Twitch as well. Um, so to kick things off, I thought I'd just walk us through the agenda. So I'll talk a little bit about myself, I'll talk about my Twilio journey, um, and then I'll focus a good chunk on my experience using Twilio with uh, this project called Request Now. Um, and then I'll spend some uh, like time at the end to talk about how you can build interaction on Twitch. So thought I'd start off with a few key takeaways. So I'm hoping you'll learn through the talk that businesses can do a lot with Twitch and Twilio with really little developer effort and investment. And that's because these uh, technologies are really familiar and approachable. So they shouldn't involve using like new uh, frameworks and tools or new languages that you're not aware of. Um, and this is really important because it can allow you and your business to experiment quickly, um, you can learn quickly, and you can figure out on what channels are the most valuable for you to reach your end customers. Um, also just wanna talk a little bit about myself. So I'm Matt, I'm a developer advocate at Twitch. I threw up this avatar because I thought that was kind of cool. I haven't seen a conference where you can make your own avatar, so I recommend all of you to make your own. Um, I also threw up my Twitch channel and my Twitter if you want to follow me. And then a brief um, about myself. I've been in developer relations for the last like six years. I started at AWS, then I worked at Optimizely, their startup that's just down the street, and now I'm at Twitch. And then I also threw up the Twilio Champions logo there. If you're not familiar, it's a program that is run by Twilio to recognize and inspire uh, developers who have been using the product for a while. Um, you might be curious what I do at Twitch. So in this developer advocacy role, I spend a lot of time uh, chatting with developers and taking your feedback and bringing it back to the product teams. Um, also do uh, like talks like these. So you can see here I'm giving a talk on Stardew Valley. I also do streams. Um, I'm doing a live stream with my coworker, uh, Nikki, who's right here in the front. Um, and then um, I also work on content, so you might see things like this chatbot guide, for example. So the reason we're all here is because of Twilio. I learned about Twilio around seven years ago. I went to a meetup in New York City, and I was really inspired because uh, the evangelist who did this talk basically used a few lines of code and sent everyone in the audience a text message and a phone call, and I just hadn't seen anything like that at the time. So it was super interesting that with such little code, you could uh, like provide that impact. Um, I was also in school, and I really didn't have a lot of programming experience. Um, I was just learning, and I really had no API experience, and Twilio like, made it super easy to understand their own technology, but also just the ecosystem of APIs, as I didn't have a lot of experience with that. Um, I didn't really get discouraged, because they had a great uh, network. Um, I know they have tons of evangelists, um, and it was super easy to get help. Some of you are probably already familiar with how um, SMS works with uh, Twilio, but I just thought I'd get us all on the same page super quickly. So essentially, if you text a Twilio number, it's managed by the Twilio service, so it's just mapped to your account, and then um, the service will basically, in a webhook-like fashion, will send your endpoint um, a request with all contextual information. So things like the from number, the to number, and then of course the body of the text message. And then your application, as the developer, can parse that information and can have like business logic, and then if you want, you can respond back, and then the Twilio service will then uh, send that back to the user. So as I was saying, like in 2012, I was just learning about uh, Twilio. I was super excited about the technology, and I was working on a few projects, and I, and I wanted to throw like Twilio into all of them. So I'll walk you through a few. So the first is Project Cookie. So <laughs> um, you can probably imagine what that is, but essentially it was a student-run business in college to help uh, students get like treats when they're studying in the library. And one of the problems was it was being run by student employees, and it was really hard to track how long these um, employees were working. So I thought it would be cool if we could enter all of their phone numbers into a, um, a database and map it to like their first name or their email address, for example, and allow them to use super easy commands. So things like clock in and clock out. And when those um, commands are run on the back end, we can just take a, um, a timestamp and then just like take the delta to figure out how long they work. So I think this is a good example of something that was really like pretty um, easy to implement but had really large um, business impact. 
Another example is a bit more fun. So I went to IKEA for the first time in 2012, and I really struggled with trying to figure out how to find the items in the warehouse uh, from the showroom. So they give you these like IP address looking, um, I think they call them article numbers, and um, I thought it'd be cool to build a bot where I could just text this um, article number and get back in like a shopping cart type style uh, the island bin number. So it would make it super easy when I'm in the uh, warehouse. And this project is actually on my GitHub, so if you want to check it out, I don't think it will still work today, but um, I did think that was pretty cool. And then some time progresses here, the iMessage interface uh, got a little better, I got a job at AWS, and Twilio also announced uh, their new service for sending photos in a text message. So I thought it would be cool to build a demo where you could send a photo of yourself uh, uh, like to the cloud. I think I called it like selfies in the cloud, for example. And you could just take your phone, you could just take a photo of yourself and send it to a, a Twilio number and you get back a link that saves the photo um, in the storage service. So here's just a few examples. And like most people, I was super excited about Twilio, as you can see. So I wrote a tweet in 2012. I took a screenshot of it. I thought this was kind of funny. I didn't have any followers at the time, but I did get one like uh, and it was from the CEO. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, so I thought I'd share that. Um, so to switch gears a little bit, I wanted to focus on requests now. So in high school and in college, I was doing some DJing on the side, and I noticed at all these parties that these guests like really wanted to hear song requests. They wanted to hear songs that they were excited about. But it was hard because either the environment was super loud and I couldn't hear them, or like guests were timid and like they didn't want to come up to the DJ, or they were just really distracting for the DJ itself, sort of like what's happening in this photo, which was taken a few months ago, I don't think he's super happy that I'm talking to him, uh, but basically the problem is there's no communication channel between the DJ and the audience. And around this time, it's still 2012, I was taking a train ride on Metro North and they just came out with this bot, although I don't think SMS bots were actually a thing at that time, but um, you would essentially like send it your station codes and it would text you back um, the different uh, departure times. But not only did it do that, it also sent back this ad. And that was super interesting to me because I got this ad and it was just like something I hadn't really seen before and it made me believe that these businesses would be built on uh, text message. And I really didn't see a lot of bots at that time. So it really got me thinking that potentially I could build this business on SMS. And I wanted to look at all the solutions for DJs. So if you are a DJ, you probably know that um, the first thing that you can use, the simplest uh, solution, is like a clipboard. So a physical clipboard that you can put out and folks can write um, their song requests. And I think a good way to think about a clipboard is this like low touch way to get feedback because folks can write it and then when the DJ has a second, they can look at it. Um, there was also Google Voice at the time, but there's no such like programming or like customization, so I didn't see that being super helpful. Um, I could have also built an iOS, Android, or even at the time a BlackBerry app, but I didn't have the skill set for that, and I also didn't think at an event someone would want to take their cell phone out. Like if you're at a party, I didn't think you'd want to take your phone out and download an app. So everything was pointing to build a Twilio-powered app because it's super lightweight, it's just a phone number, um, it's single use, it would be easy for me as the developer to program it, and it's super interactive. So um, I sat down and I thought about this version one, like what would this system look like? So to make it super simple, I thought that the guests could send a text message to a Twilio number of a song request, and then I would just print that body into a text file. And then it would just auto respond back to the guest saying like, thanks for your text message. So at this point, I think I'm at parity with something like a clipboard. And I tried it at an event. So here's um, a screenshot from an event. It's kind of blurry, so you can't see what's on the iPad, but um, it's just uh, the text file. So you can see on the left all the from numbers and then um, the body of the request is in the middle. And like all the party goers were super excited, people were texting it and it was super cool because we were getting a few hundred requests. So then at that night, I went onto the Twilio console, so here's the screenshot, and we got around 400 requests, which was super mind blowing. So um, I went back and wanted to think about a V2. And the idea here was, how can we build this as an actual business? How could other DJs use this to keep their DJ business relevant? Because at the time, it was uh, 
the barrier, uh, the entry to become a DJ was super low in the sense that you could just pretty much buy like speakers and bring your iPad or laptop. It was sort of being disrupted from the time when you had to bring a lot of like records and CDs. So a lot of DJs were entering the market. So I thought this was a pretty neat way to do something different. Um, so I knew that um, I would need an account uh, like management system. I would need a better backend for DJs. Using a text file isn't going to be super helpful. And then it would also be cool to have some song detection, something to make it fun. So when you text a song, we can try to recognize it. Um, as well as to really build a business, I thought it would be cool to have this like custom branding and a thank you message sent at the end of the party. So I think I messaged uh, that I didn't want this to be super distracting for a DJ. And to really think about that, we would need to add a lot of structure for this app. So we needed some way to sort similar songs. We would need a way for the DJ to be able to respond back to the party goer. And we would want to let the DJ inform guests of what's next up. So I was sort of thinking about like, what would this structure look like? So we could use a token like play or some sort of keyword, and then uh, the string following that could be the song name. So if they put play, we would assume everything following that is the song name. But then some of the guests uh, were saying that they'd love to include the artist. And that's where things got a bit more tricky because you could say like, get lucky by Daft Punk or Dash or like just space. So it was really hard to add this conformity that um, our algorithm would be able to pick on. And if we were to like tokenize on the word by, for example, there'd be some false negatives because by itself could be in the name of the song. And then folks just didn't care about the conformity at all and would just send like random messages to us like Taylor Swift, for example. Um, but having said that, I thought it was in a pretty good place to try it out at another event. So here's what it looked like. So this is an example of what the DJ saw at an event. And as you can see, it did not go as we thought. So you can see the keyword play in the first example is like three words in. Uh, you know, they're commenting on like our hygiene. The last one is this like super sincere note about a song that they want to hear. And then the last one is this random message about uh, Ariana Grande. So again, something an algorithm is going to have a lot of trouble picking up on. So we knew we'd have to go back and really think about how are we going to make this work. So, I have here um, a version 2.1. So I knew that we would have to add more structure. So something like a welcome message. So maybe we can convey that it is, in fact, a bot and really enforce this place syntax. Because it was clear that people didn't realize they were texting an algorithm versus like a DJ itself. Um, and then I think it also would make sense to allow the DJ to see the original text in case we like misidentify it. And then since the data is digital at this point, we can apply automation, we can apply data science, all these advantages over that clipboard. So why not integrate with third party services like Spotify or the Bing Video API? Because they have great databases of these songs. So why not be able to validate against those? So I'm skipping maybe like six months here of development work, but we were able to get it into a pretty good spot. So if you use the word play and then student tie, so that was a popular song in 2013, you would get back, thanks for playing Suit and Tie by Justin Timberlake. And then you see that custom message. And then at the end of the event, you would get that thank you message. So again, just more ways to drive engagement uh, and branding. And then on the right side, there's some silly examples, but you kind of get the sense that we were even able to handle some spelling mistakes. So the whole like Harlem Shake thing was popular. So if you typed in play Harlem Bake, we would still get it right. And then a few other examples there. So I thought it'd be fun if we took a second and we did a quick demo. So if you want to take your phones out, um, I set up this event. Let me just turn my laptop on. It looks like people have been playing with it. But if you can see the number and you want to try it, try to send any song. Tr you can try to use the play syntax or not. Um, let's take a second here. So all the things that you see on the right are going to be songs. And then things on the left are just random messages. So things that we couldn't identify as songs. So it looks like some people are trying this. So it looks like two people requested Get Lucky, for example. And this will update in real time. So I'll wait another few seconds. So someone wants to hear Red by Taylor Swift. So again, it didn't have that correct syntax. We weren't able to identify it as a song. Let's see. Wow, we're getting a lot of requests. Um, so it looks like for the most part, it seems to be working. Um, again, though, you might get the wrong song request, and then the DJ can still see um, the original text, for example. So if I click this, someone in the audience will get a notification that their song is up next. 
So I can click that and then I can even respond back by just opening this up and just typing a message like, we've already played that or that's coming up, for example. Um, so yeah, it looks like some things are not working and some are. Uh, anyway, let's go back to the slides and I thought I'd share a few takeaways of just using SMS for the last few years. We could go, okay, so back to the slides. Um, so a few of my takeaways. So essentially, I think a lot of us really believe that SMS can feel like stupidly simple or just really simple at times. And I think that's okay. And I think the reason we feel that way is because it feels super transactional in the sense that if we have like a dentist appointment coming up, we'll get a reminder or like a restaurant like reservation, for example. But I think we did a really good job of like playing between that balance of transactional and like pretty engaging because we did things like try to identify the songs if you had some syntax. But if we did not get the song correctly, you would just get a more transactional message back, something on the, along the lines of thanks for your request because we did not know what they actually wanted to hear. So I think it's important to think about how can you make these bots feel um, engaging but also you know, have some interesting um, algorithms behind it. We also allowed for a two-way conversation. I also don't think you see this a lot. So usually you think SMS is really like one way, but I think we did a good job of being able to inform people when their song is up next and allow the DJ to even type messages uh, like back to the party guests. And then um, in terms of this like asynchronous versus uh, synchronous thinking, I think um, one of the powers of a bot is that the DJ does not always need to be free, right? So if the DJ is in the middle of a mix and maybe has like a you know, five second break, they can look at requests now and see all the song requests and they can even respond back and maybe the party goer is busy but they can later look at their phone. So I think originally it was pretty synchronous, right? Like the DJ would have to be available in order for you to give the song request but now we produce this system in which uh, folks can sort of talk when they're available. And then the last thing I'll share is you should really be authentic and I think we made it clear that it was a bot so we sent that welcome message, but at the same time, we also stayed true to like a DJ party. In a sense, we had that custom message. So um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about Twitch. I imagine some of you are curious on how you can build interaction on Twitch. And I think an interesting parallel here is that SMS can seem really simple in the sense that um, you don't have to really program a lot, like Twilio um, abstracts a lot away from you. And the same goes for Twitch. So some of the solutions you'll see are really familiar technologies, the main one being an iframe, and a lot of you are, I'm sure, web developers, and that's not that complicated. So you don't need to learn a new language, but they provide a lot of value. So this is a bit of like a salesy slide, but essentially uh, the magic of Twitch is between uh, the broadcaster, uh, the audience, and the underlying content. So sort of all those coming together make Twitch really special. In case you're not familiar with Twitch at all, uh, it's a live streaming platform, mostly for video games, but there's a lot of other categories on there. So I thought I'd share a screenshot. In this screenshot, we have a broadcaster here. He is streaming the popular game Fortnite. It looks like he has 19,000 viewers watching him, and you can see all the interactivity is happening in chat on the right-hand side. So that is a pretty fast feed of all these folks trying to talk to one another. So the first way to build interaction on Twitch would be through bots. So you could write your own bot. And if you're not familiar with a bot, essentially it's this like programmatic way to use commands to respond uh, in chat. So in this example, you can see the dice command will just print a random number from one to six. You might be familiar with like a Slack bot, for example, but there's also some more um, interesting use cases. So you can use bots to moderate chat, you can use bots to answer common questions, as well as even use chat to control what's happening in a game. So I wanted to show an example of this. I purposely picked a pretty well-known brand. I'm sure all of us know Wendy's. And the idea with Wendy's is that they were trying to promote uh, this like $1 any size fries. I wasn't aware that they had that, but they were trying to just draw awareness about this uh, promotion. So what they did was anytime someone cheered, so in Twitch, if you wanna support the streamer, you can donate to them using bits, and bits is this digital good. Um, so I thought I'd share this video of what it actually looked like. So let's watch this. Damn! Ooh, I got the fresh $1 Friday French fries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here for the two of them, and then another 10 of them. Whoa! Whoa, whoa, whoa. DJ with another 100 bits. What are you doing, man? Twitch Prime, so I bust a rhyme. Get your French fries for $1 right on time. Damn. <laughs> 
Wow, okay, so uh, you know, I think what's cool there is that it didn't take a lot of work to actually interact with Twitch. It was a pretty easy integration and it's really authentic to Twitch in the sense that we're using streamers, we're using the native uh, bits plugin and we're building an overlay. So we're not really taking folks to like another site, for example, it's all happening within Twitch. Um, another example of something that you can build on Twitch is an overlay extension. So this is the idea that you can build an experience on top of the video feed. So this is called an overlay extension, which takes up the whole video feed. We also have a component extension. So this is something that's interactive on the right-hand side. And then we also have a panel extension, which is interaction under chat or sorry, under the channel. And then lastly, you can also use monetization if you wanna build an extension that takes bits. Um, so I wanna walk through an architecture diagram on how this works. So like I said, the technology is really familiar. It's just an iframe. It's HTML and JavaScript and CSS. And you can program this and this will live on top of this stream. And it's served by the Twitch uh, CDN. So you don't need to worry about uh, deploying it or maintaining it. And you can optionally build a backend that will handle all the business logic. And I thought I'd also compare it to Twilio because I also think that's a really simple technology as well. So for Twilio, you don't even need to worry about a front end because the front end is essentially the mobile device that is communicating through Twilio. They have their own service that's abstracted and then you can, or you have to build a back end in this case, but you can also use the Twilio SDK which has all the functions to make SMS work. So I have two last examples. Um, so here is an extension using the popular game called Stardew Valley. I'm not sure if you're all f uh, familiar, but essentially it's a simulation game where you simulate like running your own farm. Um, it's pretty popular, it's really relaxing, and I built an extension that allows viewers to interact with uh, the broadcaster and other folks in chat. So the idea here is that in the game there's about five different weather conditions, so sun, rain, wind, storm, and snow, and I thought it would be fun to allow the viewers to vote on what weather condition uh, the streamer should experience. And the reason why that's interesting is because the weather conditions make it uh, either like more difficult or easier uh, to grow uh, your crops. So it was really easy to build because I just wrote this simple front end uh, for the viewer and the broadcaster. So you can see that on the right and it has the native uh, assets. And then I wrote a back end that was simple as well. It just tallied up all the votes. And then um, I also had to create a game mod that would sit in between the back end and the game to actually force that new weather. Um, here's another example now that also is a well-known brand. So Reese's um, also did another promotion with Twitch to try to drive awareness towards their, I guess their Reese's egg candy bar um, around Easter. So the idea was let's build an extension that can allow the viewers to play with the brand. So they basically had these like eggs on the screen and you'd have to click them. Um, and if you like found them uh, as in like an egg hunt, you would get points and the points could be exchanged for bits. So I have a similar video. I do wanna warn you that I wasn't able to find a ton of videos and this one has a really sort of salesy <laughs> tone to it, so yeah. Whoops. And, and brought it to the next level with the innovative Reese's Egg Hunt Twitch extension. I do love Reese's, they are my baby. We partnered with top Twitch influencers for a fun, interactive experience. It's that uh, egg extension. And if you click the eggs, you get points for the eggs. Allowing viewers to hunt for Easter eggs within their streams via Twitch extensions. Oh, look at that! The Reese's peanut butter egg logo. Something to say, peanut butter? Reese. <laughs> Eagle eyed viewers earn points by finding Easter eggs that popped up within the stream, landing them on the leaderboard and earning them bits. Okay, so that ended a bit abruptly because I did some editing there, but I think the idea there is that they're really staying true to Twitch. So they're using really simple technology. It was really e easy to build that because it was just an iframe. Um, that's all that's happening. And it was cool to stay within like the Twitch um, stream and allow people to click. Um, on the channel and to be able to find eggs and get points. So with that, I wanna end here and I hope that you really are inspired to be able to play with these technologies that don't require a lot of effort. They don't have pretty big like learning curves and you can find ways to interact with your customers. So thanks for coming.